artist. And I'm going to ask both of you, what is it, what is the cultural content of San Antonio? How did that affect your work? I know you answered it a little bit, Joe, in your, in your thing, but what is it that San Antonio promotes in your work? Well, I was born here, you know, I was born and raised here in San Antonio, and I, I you know, grew up in a barrio atmosphere, and very happy as a young man, and as I got, you know, older, uh, became a crazy guy, a the local, and I like Terry said, my art saved me, I believe, and, but uh, I'm very proud to, to be, you know, San Antonio is like a barrio. You know, I grew up in El Barrio Escondido, and when people tell me, where do you come from? Yo soy El Barrio Escondido, on South Coast. Okay. So when you go out of town and somebody asks me, where are you from? Well, I'm from San Antonio. And they say proud because you're from San Antonio. This is, this is what I know, and it was a, I, was, I was old before I ever left San Antonio. I was already in my 20s when I finally went to Barredo one time. And, I, you know, I had never experienced anywhere else. So, you know, I just love being from San Antonio. San Antonio, um, it is, it is uh, part of the, the weaving of, of any person where they're from. Um, I grew up in the west side. I went to Storm Elementary and, and uh, I had maybe my six years that I went there, I had one uh, Latina teacher, Mrs. Salinas, and it just so happened that she was my art teacher. Um, and I um, remember her always saying, you know, you're such a good artist, you're such a good artist. But, um, but I didn't have very many Latino, Chicano, Mexican-American teachers. Most of my teachers from kindergarten all the way through uh, college were were Anglo's, and so it was a, a mix of of messages. Just like Franco had stated in in his uh, piece, that there was this uh, conflict of education of a of a child, and for me, it was an embarrassment sometimes of my culture. I did not become aware of the positive things of my culture until I met Chicano artists. And I was already finishing up my degree at Trinity University. And it was because of people like Cesar Martinez, Ellen Riojas Clark, Carlos uh, Guerra, uh, George Cisneros, um, Jose Luis Rivera. These are all uh, what people that I were my my teachers in re-educating me as a Chicana, and um, I'm very proud to uh, to call myself a Chicana. But that did not come through the cultural education that I was given in public education in San Antonio. And it, it, it was always a surprise when I first was, would get conversations with Cesar and, and Jose Luis Rivera, and they were celebrating uh, the imagery and the history documenting through their artwork um, our culture. And because my education was trying to stop that out of me. When I went to Storm Elementary, we were not allowed to speak Spanish. We got spatted if we did. My parents were being told, and my grandparents were being told by public educators, people who should know better, that knowledge is power and knowledge is good. Stop speaking to this child in, in Spanish. She's an American. She must learn English. Well, they stopped speaking to me in Spanish. So it was an embarrassment when I first met my, my Chicano teachers. Uh, in, in uh, La Cultura Chicana, uh, when I was speaking Spanish, otro che moche, because that's what I learned at home. I did not have academic Spanish. I had home Spanish, and, and, and it, it can only carry you so far if you're talking to professionals in Mexico and Spain 
It only carries you so far, and then after a while they start laughing at you because here you are with a Mexican, with a Spanish surname, and you cannot speak Spanish? Well, I got, I got it whipped out of me. You know what language I learned when I went to public education high school? French. <laughs> why? Because I thought, you know, why do I need to learn Spanish? They're kicking it out of me. I, I, I plan to go to Paris. I want to travel. I'll learn French. And, and you know, and it's, it's a sad thing when we see this, a city with this, this incredible treasure trove of culture and history. And, and the conversation, I go to a lot of conversations where we talk about Chicano culture and the culture of San Antonio, and, and people, even Mexican-American, Hispanic people say, oh, you're going to get in that dialogue again. You know, we've heard it for the hundredth time, but you guys still haven't learned it. So we still must have this conversation that the culture that a child grows up in is the foundation of their human citizenship. And until you get it, we're going to keep talking about it. So if you don't want to hear it again, then get on the ball and, sh and come along and let's celebrate diversity instead of like what Arizona did. Take away knowledge because you're afraid that they're indoctrinating them to hate the United States of America. Give me a break. <laughs> so I think sometimes in my sense, for my city, it was not, when I was growing up, it was not a, ci a city that, as, as Frankel and, uh, put it earlier, was not a city that, that celebrated us. It, it was a city in this, I grew up in the 60s and 70s and 80s, that was in denial. And so for me, the city, my, my city was one that it came very late for support. I mentioned in the film how my community supported me, but it supported me when I came out of college and I was <coughs> looking for my voice. And it was because I met the elders of the Chicano Movimiento. I was fortunate enough to meet the founders of the Gonzafos organization that was nurturing, developing, and documenting Chica the Chicano Movimiento politically, socially, and artistically in San Antonio. And I don't know what, what would have happened if I hadn't met them. But culture and, and for the city and me, it, it's, it's not this, it didn't work the same way, you know, and, and, and um, I think that, thank goodness I'm a little bit of a pelionera, not as much as my friend, friend Barbara Geno Gonzalez over there, but I have a little bit of that, you know, because we're both cancers. <laughs> and whether you're 50, 60, 70s, 80s, 2000, the issues are the same. So my, uh, another question would be that as people view your work, uh, both of yours, from a, from a gallo con un corazón pero enorme, ¿verdad? You know, with the nerves and all of that vibrating in that corazón, to that woman with the knife stuck in her tongue to rip out her Spanish, what is it that you would want our, our, our comunidad to see in your work? What, what perspectives or what do you want them to reflect upon? With my work, I, if, uh, what I'd like for people to see is the sincerity that I, that I have with my images and the pride that I have in the things that I paint. And you know, My paintings are about life in the barrio or about scenes of growing up in the barrio atmosphere, the icon, the lion, you know, the symbol of luck, and and Dia los Muertos, you know, I think Dia los Muertos. I'm known for those three things: the rayo, the Dia los Muertos, and my cultural paintings that I call cultural paintings. Yeah, and uh, you know when. You know, I have a gallery, and people go to my gallery, and they walk around. And it's called like Gaista. <laughs> Gaista gallery. Uh, the comments, some people, especially some Mexicanos, are intimidated about going into an art gallery. 
I know when I was younger, I was, I didn't feel like I belonged in an art gallery because I grew up, you know, I come from humble beginnings and I felt out of place. I had an inferiority complex. But when people come into my gallery and, you know, they're a little shy about going in there and, and when they walk around and a lot of times I give the tour and I don't just talk about my artwork. I show every the different artists that I have there. A lot of them are self-taught, but uh, you know, they feel good about themselves. And, and I think that like my artwork, the, the comments I get or people say, oh, I remember that. Oh, that's my deal. Or I had a lady screaming one day and I thought she'd fall, she'd fallen. And I went, well, are you all right? And she said, oh yes, but that's my gallo, that's my gallo. That gallo used to run after me every time. I couldn't go anywhere because he would follow me. And I'm over here like, but she related to it. And I think that's what happens when people see my work. And they relate to things. And you know, it makes me feel good when people do that. So I'm very proud of that fact. And, you know, I, like I said, I paint for Joe Lopez, I don't paint for other people. When, when people see my work and they feel good about it and it moves them, it touches them, it's the biggest compliment to me. It, you know, the money's fine. When you sell, it's good. Money helps you keep going. But to me, when somebody relates to my work and, and just feels good about it and it touches their heart, that means a lot to me. For me, unlike Joe, I, I like my work to ha kind of have a shock factor, you know, because um, I, I work in a style that is kind of expressionistic. I run a lot of my work with my soul, one of my other soul sisters, Joan Frederick there. And uh, Joan has known me for a long time. And so when I'm working on a series, I'll call her up and, and she's very frank with me about, about the work. and. Uh, and she's not Chicana, but she she knows me in and out. And so I I, I, I ask her to look at my work. I, I call my friend Barbara Reno Gonzalez, and she comes and checks it out. And she always goes, ah, whoa, when it hits it, the nail on the head. But she, like I said, she's a pelioneta, so she likes the, the rub against for the viewer, right? But with me, I like, I like my work sometimes, to most times, to be a little disturbing. And partly because... Um, like Joe, I, I paint what I know and what's in me. And sometimes, like I was mentioning in the film, I, I go to a lot of dark places. The dark place, that idea of dark places is, is not a new idea, but it's something that I learned from my friend Sandra Cisneros. She tells writers that go to her workshops, you must always go to that place where you're most afraid of going to. If you want to write something that's worthy to read, go there. And it's the same for artists. And so for me, it's like I always kind of do disturbing things. That's why my mother wanted me to burn all my paintings. Because it was disturbing. She's like, ¿Tú tienes eso adentro de ti? ¿Cómo? ¿Cómo es? Es un monstruo. And I'm like, no, mother, it's, it's called emotion. It's called what's in my, my soul and in my brain. It has to come out some way or another. And I painted, uh, and I, when I first started painting, I painted in an expressionistic style. And it, and it changes. I'm still, I'm still trying to find out my voice sometimes. You know, I, I, right now I'm doing a whole series of work that's influenced by books and words. Uh, why? Because I do book covers for a lot of different art authors. Gary Soto, <coughs> Sandra Cisneros. And, and my last one was for Bar Barbara Reno Gonzalez for her book, Golondrina, Why Did You Leave Me? Those darn golondrinas are still flying around in my head. And uh, they're, they're still wanting to, to be the center of attention. So I let it be, you know, I let it happen. And, but I, I tend to paint more of a disturbing style. And I want people to think, if there's anything, I, I don't care if you like it or don't like it, quite frankly, but I hope it makes people, the viewer, think. Think. It, and think, you know, why don't I like this? Why is it so disturbing to me? Because that's that dark place. It's touching a chord. 
It's not the aesthetics, it's the meaning that is touching the core. If you like it, why do I like it? You know, what is it that I that connects with me? Um, and I, that's what I hope my artwork does. That it makes the viewer think. Um, because bottom line, um, we all have similar stories, and and artists just reflect those stories. In fact, some of the many of the artists that I know reflect our dreams. Well, my technical learning curve is extremely steep, and so today I learned that you can't house the movie in a PowerPoint. <laughs> the audio off, so the audio is not off, but I'm just kind of not as literate as I, I need to be. Um, but the process, you know, it started in the class with, with our group projects, and then coming to speak to our class, and so the, we got a lot of the theory and the content. Um, personally, I'm from San Antonio too, and uh, so I, it was a lot of spoke to my experience, spoke to my cousins and my, my relatives that are all here. Uh, and what we did was we, we looked at the, the, the shared experience within their personal experience uh, and more of like a San Antonio type experience and we tried to fight all our technical issues um, and put that together. So it was actually a lot longer uh, process than we anticipated. Um, but we ended up getting really great help from a friend of mine, Miguel Casillas and Nick Danko, who do um, DVD production out of Landscape. Um, so they kind of cleaned up a lot of the... We didn't want the, the, the stories to be lost through the visuals or the, the bad editing on my part. Um, and so hopefully their messages were there. So like we were talking about the content, we were, we were trying to focus <coughs> once we found it. And hopefully we were true to what y'all were trying to say. We tried to get that uh, clear to the audience, and hopefully you understood or, or could relate. I saw a few people laughing. I don't know if yeah. my cousins were laughing at me, but at least, <laughs> but at least there were some hopefully relative or maybe new ideas. So, so what did y'all think about it, Joe? And, and, and well, uh, I have to say that you know I've had other documentaries done about me in my gallery, and when uh, Cindy and, and Soledad came to to my gallery to visit. You know, there were some st students that said, can we come by and interview you? And I said, yeah, sure. I love both of you I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't dressed for being filmed. Uh, but the one thing about this documentary is that I said some things that, that I hadn't said before. And, uh, you know, I was relaxed. And, you know, I, I, at my gallery, you know, that's my, uh, my that's place. And that's my sanctuary. And, and I don't worry, you know, I say things, do things, whatever, I act crazy. It's my gallery, it's my place, my, my sanctuary. But uh, there's some things I said that, like I said, you know, I was a lot of local, crazy guy, got in a lot of trouble as a, as a young man. And I was bitter, I guess, I don't know. I mean, I was just, uh, you know, one of the Vato locals was dirty, you know, I wanted to be a tough guy, I didn't want anybody to mess with me, or, you know, I was bullied as a young boy, and, and, and you know, I, I finally had to fight the bully, and, and I beat him up, and, and you know, the, um, so I, I kind of let go with this, with this documentary, and I think it, it, uh, it says a lot about me, and, uh, I'm honored to have been one of the featured artists. You know, I've been around for a long time. Jose um, Esquivel, who is here, Chista, those two guys, uh, you know, I was painting wildlife at one time, and Raul Gutierrez was my, I was inspired by Raul Gutierrez. But, you know, Chista and Jose talked to me about Chicano art. And although I don't paint very, you know, what some people might not think is Chicano. You know, growing up, you, you know, you see both sides. Like I said, when I was a young man, those, those cultural things, those traditions that I saw, mis abuelas, mis tias, mi mamá, mi papá, you know, those are things that I enjoy. But I, I, you know, I also saw the ugly side. I mean, I went through a lot of, uh, a dark period in my life. And uh, I have to give credit to my, my wife, Frances, Mary Frances, and uh, my mother. They kind of helped in my art. 
they held me back. But as far as this this uh, documentary, uh, that's a little embarrassing. But I mean, I think it was very <laughs> very honest. Very honest. Okay. to stand up because she was part of the group that filmed that film. And then Joanne Tripps also dealt with one of the other ones. And then over here we have Victor. Cindy's the other one that helped. So the rest of you will see you will see the work. So what did you think about it? Oh, I loved it, and what I what I love is that I, I can't stress the importance of what Ellen stated earlier of of the documentation of our work. Um, you can never have too much documentation, and so what I love about it is that many of the artists, if not all of them, that are on there are artists that I truly respect and hold in high regard and um, who influenced my work as well, like Deborah Vasquez and Adriana. You know, they, 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 they're younger than me, but they, I learned so much from them. Um, and I, I hope that films like this can, can teach and open more doors and, sh and give the validity that, uh, the continued validity that the community of artists here in San Antonio uh, should have. And the documentation is, is, is incredibly urgent. Uh, it's amazing how many Latino, Chicano artists there are and how little documentation there is. Professional documentation. And uh, so something like this is on so many levels, uh, knowledge for generations to come, and also for us as an artist, it's a, it's a way of, of validating our work. Because even though uh, Joe and I are, are seasoned uh, and experienced artists, and we, and we pursue the education of younger artists, him through his gallery, me by being an arts educator at a high school, uh, our kids are still in, in, in disbelief that art is, just like my parents, that art is a valid thing. And partly is because they don't see it celebrated. And it's not documented in education. And so this film, I think, is, is another stepping stone for continuing those doors to open and to validate uh, artists that are in the film, artists that are out in the community, uh, new artists, up-and-coming artists, uh, so that they know historically where we fit and that we existed. Because it's only us that can document it. That's true. That's okay. yeah. If we want our story to be heard. So now we're going to open it up to questions from you. And I would imagine that the first question is going to be, ¿Dónde está el barrio escondido? Right? <laughs> <laughs> so ask questions of Daniel and, and Joe and, and Terry. To answer your question about the barrio escondido, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I grew up on the north side of San Antonio. I grew up over there by the quarry. Cementville, uh, right? They, they Cementville. called it Cementville. And I, I didn't live in Cementville. Cementville was a little village yeah. where workers lived inside. Yeah. But uh, it was fenced in. And we were outside of Cementville. Ah, uh, you lived so, on the right side of the No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no we, they were better off than we were. <laughs> They had a steady job. Their parents had a steady, their fathers had a steady job. But we were just a small uh, little community there, and, and we grew up very Raza, very Mexicanos, right where okay. St. Anthony de Parao is, and if anybody knows that shrine, that's in the church. That's where I grew up, and that's why they called it El Barrio Escondido. My brothers, my older brother, would hang with the guys from Cementville, and when they go places, they say, Where are you from? Well, we're from Cementville, and, and they told, and he's from the Guadalajara. So that's where the, the hidden neighborhood. Is. <laughs> very proud and very awesome. Barbara, uh, I commend you. It's wonderful. I'm so glad I got to see this. 
Um, I my question is to you, Ellen, and perhaps the other artists can also explain some of it. When are we going to see a Chicano art museum in San Antonio? Yeah. A Chicano art museum in San Antonio. I know well, Adan was working on that premise. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, we. What I do you think there, there is? I I have no idea. Can I say something? Yes. I think that uh, when the Smithsonian and they opened this Alameda, you know, I think originally Adan and some other Chicano artists had, had talked about it. And, you know, they, they wanted to create a Chicano art museum. And, well, the Alameda is what happened. They kind of pushed them aside and their ideas and they did their own thing. So, you know, I. Yes, we had this huge press conference, remember what I was saying, coming out about the whole museum and all. And then I guess if, if you don't come into it with the funding and the, you know, exactly what you want, where you can handle it, it, it goes off in a, another way. But we need it. Preguntas otras? Yeah, um, and this is for uh, anyone on the panel. In fact, all of you guys, um, to find uh, what 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 exactly is Chicana and Chicano to you uh, at the start, at the inception of your creative process, your art making process, and what it means to you now. To me, a Chicano, you know, people ask, "What is a Chicano?" You can ask different people, and they'll give you a different answer. They'll talk about Aslan and other things. I'm not an intellectual artist. I didn't hear about a slanto out of the corner. But to me, simply put, is the Mexican American or somebody that came from Mexico at a young age and grew up in the water atmosphere and, and you know, speaks English and Spanish. Chicano, that's, that's what I think. For, for me, my, my um, belief in who I am as a Chicana has not changed. It is the same as in 1982 when I. 1981 is when I met Cesar Martinez and Ellen. Um, it has not changed. It is uh, the identity of knowing both of my histories, my American history and my Mexican history. Uh, it's interesting when, when a Chicana or Chicana goes to Mexico, we're gringos. Yeah. They call, well, they call me in Michoacan, my, my friends there in Michoacan when I would go and paint in the summers, uh, they would call me, oh, esta gringa es de San Antonio, Texas, and then everybody would giggle, giggle, giggle. No soy, no soy gringa, no soy gringa. Soy chicana, soy mexicana, americana, pero no soy gringa. Pero para nosotros eres gringa. And, you know, for us, you're a gringa. Uh, and for me, you know, I'm not, to me that word is, and it's really interesting how words are really powerful. You know, sticks and stones may break my bones, and, but words will never hurt me. It's a lie. It's a lie. Okay? Words are very powerful. Why do I take offense to being called a gringa then? Because historically that word in San Antonio means something totally different. You know, it means coming up from Alamo Heights, living in Alamo Heights as an Anglo-American with a lot of money. Or a, it's not poor white trash, okay? Yeah. But for me, that, that, that definition of who I am has not changed. I wanted to, to just point, going back to Barbara's question about the Chicano uh, Art Museum, <coughs> Chicano Chicano Art Museum. Um, I think just like with documentation, I think that a community needs to raise the money, do it on themselves. You don't wait for your government to do it. You don't wait for the Henry Munoz and the Ford Company to bring the money to the table. The community of artists and the community of educators and the community of citizens who want that must make it happen because it would be more meaningful and it will last way longer than the Alameda did, okay? <coughs> and uh, I think that if it is something that we want to do and we feel is important, we must, as Chicanos, as Mexican Americans, as Latinos, must put it together and make it happen. <coughs> we don't wait for the local government to, to take right. it on. 
Can I say something? One of the biggest compliments that I get when people go to to the East Gallery and they walk around and we have all these different artists in it, not the artists about polit politics, about religion, you know, different things. And several people have told me, this is better than Yalamela. This is really a Chicano. A Chicano. And you know, I, I didn't plan it, you know, I'm a Chicano, that's what I am, that's what I know. So, you know, I just, artists come to me, a lot, a lot of them that I never knew, they come to me and they say, can I put my art in here? And if, it, if I like it, they're in, you know, and... Uh, Even if you don't like it. Well, I mean, well, <laughs> there's very little art that I don't like. And, and then I don't want to say that I don't like is that I don't understand. <laughs> But I, I like your work. I think it's very powerful. I, 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 I like it. But uh, you know, I, that's the biggest compliment that I've gotten about my, my gallery. And his gallery runs on a shoestring, it's, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's not a fancy schmancy. It's rascuache, yeah. but it's rascuache with respect and honor. Yeah. And and you know, sometimes the. the people who rent from him, the artists who rent the studio space, they'll have a leak and he's like, okay, let me see where I can hustle the money. <laughs> and and like uh, Luis Valderas and Kim Bishop and Paul Kara, who's right sitting there. in the back there, and he's in the in the movie. Uh, you know, they have a gallery there and in, when it rains, they're like, oh God, I hope nothing wet, gets wet. And, and Joe's real concerned about it and he'll try to hustle up the monies because he runs that thing on his retirement. You know, and, and on the little bit of rents that you get. Well, we're self-supported, and uh, you know, my wife. You don't and get I, any money from the city, oh, right? No, from grants. And I, I've had bad experience, not bad experience, but you have to sign your life I'm too crude to <laughs> 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 I think uh, to answer so the, the question, Victor, for you, um, I think for me as a Chicana, it means I'm politically involved means I vote every single time. It means I give my little money that I can, so I work it. And I guess to your question, um, uh, Barbara, being a Chicana also means que tengo, tengo manos de jarro. <laughs> so it means I have to do that to get be sure that we get a museum and that nobody can knock us over, be politically, economically involved, and so forth. Reese, you had a question? Yes, I wanted to piggyback on Terry's comment about the, the power of the word. But in, in communications, you know, the visual image is more powerful because people will remember things they saw more so than what they hear. That's true. And I think with the art is, is very important. Uh, the, the, I enjoyed the video, the first time thing. So I think in many cases, voiceovers would have been more effective over the a lot, showing a lot more. Uh, correct, correct. You know, and that type of thing, because people will remember the visual images over the... Over, over the, the voice. Good good point. Good I just want to say one other thing. At the beginning of my my experience growing up in San Antonio, Chicano was someone from California. Yeah. And probably someone kind of angry. Someone angry. So it wasn't necessarily a word that, that we grew up with or I did. So my word was more... Texan, Mexican American, like San Antonio. And it was as it wasn't never really questioned. So to me this is all kind of new uh, terminology and ideas. Interesting since it's been around for a while, huh? Yeah. yeah. And that's, I think that's young people, of education. I would be interested in hearing some of your perspectives also. <coughs> Other questions? Joe, do you want to come up and, and um, <coughs> sit up here in case I'm sure there's more questions of Paul? I also want to mention that we were very fortunate that Bombista, I guess you noticed them, people were so kind and generous because they were excited about this happening. And so we had, um, they let us use their music, Girl in a Coma, and the Mexican step-grandfather, a professor uh, from UTSA, allowed us to use the music. And then, like, like Daniel said, we also had the help from Lionsgate. And, and what was interesting about the editor, when he looked at it, who had never, ever, ever heard of any 
Chicano, much less seen any of his artwork. He was fascinated that he would be up till 3 o'clock in the morning, right, looking at our stuff and would be emailing back and forth. So it, it told me, it verified something to me, that this is something that needs to be for everybody to learn about. One of the other things we're going to be doing through ACTE, the Academy for Teacher Excellence, is that we're pulling out pieces of this to make videos to teach about science and math. For example, when, when um, Franco talks about the cakes exploding and the thing, you know, all of that, that's science. So we're going to be using some of those excerpts in tr teacher training modules. But instead of using cualquier otra cosa, we're going to be using Chicano artists in there with their artwork and doing teaching math and so forth. So here's uh, Jose Esquivel. He and I are the oldest ones here. We go back to the early Gonzapo days. And of course, Andy's here too. You should come up here también. Questions? He's right there. Uh, uh, So this is the first time some of you have probably seen some of the um, Chicano artists that go way back. Ask questions. I'm gonna just, I, got. I have a question okay. for the artist, for Joe and for okay. Terry. What, you know, what is it that keeps you motivated? I mean, what are the things that, that inspire you to continue to produce, to continue to work at your art, to stay fresh? What are those, what are those ideas and where, where do you get that inspiration? Is it local? Is it international? How, how, do, you, how do you do that? Oh, you know, we're all born with a gift. You know, I, I was born with the gift of art to be able to do art. I quit painting and drawing for many years. When I was younger, I was very discouraged. But it's in your heart. It's in your blood. So, you, you, you know, Sometimes you, I remember when I had given up on painting and drawing and, and I went to the bank and they had this display of artwork at, at the bank and, and it was beautiful paintings that were about football. But uh, I, I saw them and, and, you know, I love football, but I, I saw them and I read the, the story of this the artist. He was 18 years old. And I was like 32 or something like that and I said, I can do this. This guy's only 18 years old. I can do this. I, you know, I have talent. So that brought me back. And, you know, we don't just sit and paint and, and draw all day long. There's times that I'm driving and I'm thinking of things that, that I want to paint. And, you know, but it's something that, that's in you. You know, singers, you know, actors, poets. It's something that's in there, in your heart, in your that you're born with that you want to, to do. And, and I mean, I just, that's what I do. I mean, I, there's times that I go through spells that I don't paint, and, uh, but I eventually come back and start doing it. For, for me, it's, it's, it's uh, I have some current things, that, recurring themes that I do. I, I love doing uh, naturalezas muertas, uh, still lifes, and I love doing portraits, and so uh, objects that I find, and I want to put them in a painting, or, or a person who has a, a feature that I love, like I'm, I'm doing a couple of portraits of some Puerto, Puerto Rican women, elders uh, from the island, that were friends, are friends of my husband, but they have such interesting features, and this spirit about them, and I thought, I want to try to capture that in a painting. But current events affect a lot of my work, too. Or books, uh, collaborations I know that I'm doing with other, uh, with an author. Um, I did a series uh, once called uh, Los Traviesos y Santos, Santos y Traviesos. And uh, Kathy Vargas was the visual director of the, of the arts uh, in Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center. And she asked me to do a show there. And it was supposed to be um, in the gallery, well, it was in the gallery of the Guadalupe the Theater. And um, I did these paintings because I did a whole series of Santos and Traviesos, saints and mis uh, traviesos, mischievous, 
mis how do you say mischievous person? Anyway, um, Jesse Helms at that time was being a real, uh, part of my French, a dumbass about NEA. She does speak French. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so uh, I wanted to respond. And I was very fortunate, well, it's really funny because Pedro uh, Rodriguez at that time was the director of the Guadalupe. Take he, tacos, take he tacos. Wrote, he wrote me a letter saying, I read what you're proposing to show. Now this is during NEA's being threatened because there were artists that got NEA grant money, uh, artists, period, there were several, one was Latino, but uh, that their work was rubbing people the wrong way. And he says, uh, Pedro tells me, I heard about your proposal for your show. I think you should consider changing the theme, being the political climate, what the political climate is right now, and we may lose funding. And I said, I told, told Kathy, you know, I really want to do this exhibit. I really want to do this, sh this show this way. She says, do it. You may have to take it down after the, the opening exhibit, but go ahead and do it. Well, what it was, was, was um, I did a dozen paintings of she devils and he devils chasing each other, naked, okay? Um, and the, they were influenced, uh, this, the technique was influenced by Maria Izquierda from a Mexican artist who would just put black backgrounds and then show the figures. She did circus figures. I was using the diablitos. And, you know, they, the, the he devils had erections and the chi devils were, had suggestive poses and, and he was freaking out. Bella was freaking out. And I'm like, please let me just show, let me just have it for the opening. He says, if one person, just one person complains about it, it's coming down. I said, okay. Well, then the, the centerpiece was a 14-foot uh, tall paper mache devil with this huge erection. <laughs> and it's supposed to be funny. You know, it's supposed to make fun of sex. Okay? And at the, su the summertime is when they have the seniors go and see movies from the Golden Age era at 12 o'clock. And so Alex was in charge of bringing the seniors. I said, oh yes, Alex, uh, the opening is Thursday. You're bringing the seniors on Friday. Can you call me and let me know how they reacted and if there were any complaints? He says, okay, I'll call you. He says, but get ready because they're real conservative because they were coming from the senior citizen homes around there on the west side. They went in, and they laughed, and they couldn't get them into the dark theater to see the movie. <laughs> <laughs> not one complaint. Not one. They got it. They got it. It was supposed to be making fun of Jesse Holmes' overreaction about sex and pee and all of this stuff, right? And... So for me, sometimes the influence happens from just daily news, and then I roll the dice and see if it works. And, um, and, and I wanted to share that because uh, I haven't painted Diablitos again since then. <laughs> okay, they were sure fun to paint, and I think my friends got a hoot out of them. And my parents didn't understand it. You know, they thought I was a sexual deviant, but uh, <laughs> but that's okay. You know. Uh, well, I guess uh, my uh, start to Chicano kind of art started in the late fifties. Uh, I was invited to join a group called Men of Art Guild, which was the most uh, prestigious group you could belong to here in San Antonio. It was composed of mainly professors from Trinity University of Texas in Austin, and uh, well, uh, uh, Jesse Almazan, Mel Casas, and myself, Felipe Reyes, and uh, Jose Guadiana, and several Latinos, Chicanos, Mexicans uh, uh, were invited to be part of the group. Uh, the group was mainly an avant-garde type of uh, abstraction and modern painting. Uh, what I 
submitted uh, uh, to be accepted was a painting called Garcia's Grocery Store. And I remember that uh, Jesse and my son had a, a little talk with me and he said, be sure that the piece that you take for acceptance is within the realm of what they do. Well, I said, well, this is what I do. And uh, Garcia's Grocery Store was a little store that was on Laredo Street that was collapsing, falling. It was a watercolor. And uh, so uh, when the day came, they, they used to vote for you. And you had to get at least three quarters of the vote to be accepted. It was a great honor to be accepted to the Men of Arts Award. So I was accepted. And uh, from then on, I started taking work that was, the imagery was barrio. And uh, we started talking Almazan, Felipe Reyes. We started talking about the work Chicano art. It was difficult to say Mexican art because we realized that our root system comes from Mexico. But legitimately, where I was not born in Mexico, I was not educated in Mexico. So we used the word Chicano as, as the identity. Um, it, uh, it's, it's like a, uh, I, I was talking to a taxi driver in Mexico City about that. And he said, well, really, the reality is que no eres papa ni camote. <laughs> you know, I'm neither here or there. So, uh, so then uh, our, our meetings uh, uh, with the Men of Art Guild were mainly about modern contemporary painting. Um, but in, in my heart, I always felt like I needed to say something else. I needed to speak um, what my culture was about, what my family was about, all the things that you hear at your house, uh, all the all my narratives were coming from the barrio, were coming from my family. And so my work was reflecting that. And uh, uh, Men of Art Guild, I think, uh, went out of business in the 60s. And so those of us that uh, still start hanging around, like Almazan, Felipe Reyes, and myself, we, uh, Jesse Almazan opened up a gallery in La Villita. And um, it was just going to be a gallery for all kinds of art. But it didn't take long before our meetings there that went into the night and we started talking uh, politics, we started talking art, we started talking about everything. And uh, I think perhaps that was the, the beginning and the manifestation where we realized that we could create our own group. So uh, at the first uh, name that we had was El Grupo because we didn't have a name. El Grupo then transformed into Pintores de Atlán and then transformed into Pintores de la Nueva Raza. And in 1971, when we brought in Mel Casas and Jesse Trevino, it became Contaco. Uh,